Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And for all who are gathered, let us take a moment to welcome everybody with a wave of peace. For those of you online, please share a word of peace in the comment or chat. Most of us, as we go out, most of all, as we go out into the world, may we greet others as people of peace. Our first reading today comes from Genesis chapter 32, verses 9 through 13 and 22 through 30. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have, I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I am afraid of him. He may come and kill us all, the mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. So he spent that night there. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the, for the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you no longer will be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve apostles, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. In my hometown of Worthington, Minnesota, wrestling is a king's sport. In fact, when it comes to fan support, wrestling easily rivals both football and basketball. When I was growing up, the junior college in town, in fact, hosted the junior college national competition every year. Those guys knew wrestling. Me, I was a basketball player, so what did I know? But I loved watching these guys wrestle. Now, if you really want to know about wrestling, there's a guy in this church by the name of Jason, Jason Ness. I don't think he's here today. But Jason has practically more pins than anybody at the University of Minnesota. He is all set to go to the 2020 Olympics until a little thing called COVID got in the way. But this guy knows wrestling. Real wrestling. Not the fake stuff you see in the worldwide wrestling thing. Or They had that at the Mall of America a couple weeks ago. They had set for the WWE wrestling. That's, I don't know what that is, but it's not wrestling. Anyhow, the wrestling, the real stuff, is what you see in the gyms and the colleges and the high schools across our country. Now, if you ever had to wrestle, though, with other things in life, that's another thing, too. Like, how many of us have had to wrestle with making ends meet? I remember going through college and trying to decide, do I have to go and donate to actually sell blood so we can buy groceries this week? That was a wrestling match. You know what I mean if you've had that? Have you ever struggled with an addiction? A lot of people have, a lot more than will admit it. If you have, you know what I mean, what it is to wrestle with something. If you had to wrestle with a family conflict where things were not exactly happy with everyone, brothers and sisters knocking along, parents and kids knocking along, well, you know what it is to wrestle with stuff like that. Or if you ever had to wrestle with your faith, sometimes in the wee hours of the day saying, God, are you really there? Do you really see me? Or kind of like Tom saying, unless I see with my own eyes, how can I believe? Struggle is with us always, moral decisions, as we decide whether to do something or not, in business and in our private lives. Yet as difficult as all these things are, the truth is that there is value in the struggle. For just as on the wrestling mat, as you pit ourselves one against another, try to make our moves, we learn our strengths through our struggles and our weaknesses. We learn what works and what doesn't work, and through the time of struggle, we can grow stronger. That's why conflict and struggle are not always a bad thing. Someone who learned that firsthand was Jacob. Jacob was no stranger to struggles. In fact, in no small part, 
he often brought the hard stuff on himself. So don't get the idea that this hero of the faith had it all together. He was just as messed up as any of us. I can identify with Jacob. And I think as we continue with our series of heroes of the faith, it would be safe to say that Jacob is one of the most complex. Now to find the rest of his story, you can read it in Genesis 25 to 29. I'm going to leave you hanging right in the middle of the story. Is what's going to happen when Esau comes? But you're going to have to go home and look at your own Bible to find out what is the rest of the story. How does it go? Anyhow, Jacob and Esau were born twins. Isaac and Rebecca were their parents. For Rebecca, it wasn't an easy pregnancy. Has anyone here had twins in this church? I lived in a church once where there's twins all over the place. Must have been something in the water out there in central Minnesota. <laughs> Anyhow, in the womb, these two were always jostling and bumping each other. Sometimes it felt like they were at war with all that jostling and jockeying going on. And that continued most of their lives. Jacob, whose name can be translated as trickster, was always on the lookout for a scheme to get ahead. But two of the worst schemes of his life were when he first tricked his brother, Esau, out of his birthright as the oldest. But the worst was when he actually tricked his father into giving him the family inheritance, to promising him that. Now, not surprisingly, I often see families struggling with inheritances. Not surprisingly, Esau wasn't totally thrilled that his brother was going to take the whole inheritance. So he made a vow. The minute their father was dead, Jacob would soon follow. So Jacob had to flee for his life. He ran back to the old country in hopes of a new beginning. Yet there he met his match when it comes to tricks and his father-in-law. First, his father-in-law tricked him into marrying the daughter he didn't love, and then he tricked him time and time again out of his wages. It reminds me of an old saying, those who live by the sword will perish by the sword. I think another corollary could be those who live by deceit shall lose through deceit. And Jacob could have lost it all had not God intervened. But once again, he got in hot water and he had to flee. Only this time, where do you go? God said, go back home. And Jacob's saying, you know what Esau is saying to me? There is no way I can go home. God's saying, trust me, go back home. So he packed up his family. He had been blessed in the end, had a huge family, 11 kids, lots of wealth. He decided to go back home. Esau hears about it, gathers an army of 400 soldiers. Now, how do you feel if you knew you had an army of 400 soldiers coming out against you? So Jacob divided his family, put them into two groups, divided his wealth, and he sent them in opposite directions, hoping at least one of those groups would survive. And then he sat down by the river to wait. You're all alone, an army of 400 is coming against you. What are you thinking about? And all of a sudden, he's in a fight for his life against someone he doesn't even know what's going on. In the middle of the night, he's in a wrestling match. But little did he know he was wrestling with God. And even in the end, his victory was not what it seemed. For that night of wrestling with our father, God could have twisted Jacob into a pretzel just like Jason in this church could twist me into a pretzel, only a hundred times worse. God, I'm completely outmatched. But it wasn't God's goal to defeat him. 
God's goal was to help Jacob learn from his, learn his own true strength and to build on that strength. God wanted him to be strong, and God wants you to be strong, too. That's why God doesn't shield us from the struggles of life. For it's exactly those struggles that we face in life that we grow strong. It's those struggles that help build faith and strengthen us with the gifts that God has given us. It's those struggles which help us prove what is true and right and honorable in God's eyes. And people, that's a good thing. Yet, are there any Scandinavians in the house? (laughs) Us Scandinavians aren't great bonds of conflict, are we? We are some of the most conflict-averse people there are in creation. We try to avoid conflict at all costs. But is that always wise? I'm not saying we should stir up conflict for the sake of conflict, but there are times when we need to stand for what we believe and figure out where we're going together as a community. There are times when, as St. Paul said to Timothy, we need to proclaim the good news and be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. There are times when we need to be willing to convince, rebuke, and encourage people, all with the utmost patience. For we are in a challenging time for the church. I don't have to tell you that. I was visiting a church a couple weeks ago. I love to look at the confirmation pictures on the walls of a church that tells a story. And this church, I said, why are there two pictures for this year? Two classes. They said, well, that year we had 170 students, and we couldn't fit them all into one service, so we had two confirmations, one in the spring and one in the fall. And now that church is worshiping worshiping about the same number of people as are right here right now. The church is facing a challenging time as people turn to easier paths. I'm not saying everyone is doing that. But for many of us, the old Adam and us is strong. It's easy to rationalize things, especially when it comes to worship and prayer and reading God's word and not doing that. But that sort of thing sets us up as an easy mark for Satan's temptations. Uh, This I speak from experience. If I neglect my prayer time, or settle for mechanical prayers. It's like hanging up a neon sign inviting all sorts of trouble. If I neglect my study of God's word, it's easy for Satan to trip me up. And the same is true for all of us. And that's why it's so important for us to stay in the word and in prayer. For all scripture is inspired by God. And it's useful for teaching, reproof, correcting, training in righteousness so that people of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture is a manual for life. So I want to challenge you today with a very concrete challenge. You parents who just gave your kids a Bible this morning. But all of us, I want to challenge us to spend seven minutes a day reading our Bible and seven minutes a day in prayer. Learn what's in the book. Talk one-on-one with God. Get to know God. If we're willing to do that, I think we will immediately begin to see the blessings. Again, I'm not asking the impossible. I'm asking for 14 minutes of time where you put God first. And I don't think there's any excuse for not doing it. I mean, it's just 14 minutes. Now, how many minutes are there in a day? Anyone real quick in math or 24 hours a day, 60 minutes an hour? 
That's 1,440 minutes in a day. I'm asking you for 1% of that day. Can we say we don't have 1% of our time for God? That 14 minutes can reshape our lives. It's a form of spiritual exercise wrestling with God through prayer and scripture. And it will give you strength for those times when we struggle with questions of faith and life and temptations and what is more, spending time with God in prayer uh, prepares us for those dark nights when we wrestle alone. Or when we're called to be the faithful church wrestling with the real issues of modern life. For armed with God's word and strengthened by the power of prayer, we can persevere. As a pastor, I become inherently hopeful. And that's partly because of my first call. In my very first church 40 years ago, there was a church that all the new pastors were saying, Dear Lord, please don't let it be Cornwall. Dear Lord, please don't let it be Cornwall. I was from another country. I didn't know any of this stuff. So when I said, you're going to Cornwall? I said, great. When I got there, on the first Sunday, there were 12 people at worship. And I was the second youngest. The only person younger was our son, Peter. But you know, I saw what God can do in bringing a church back to life. And that church came back, and they built an addition, and they grew. They doubled the size of the sanctuary. I've seen God do that time and time again. So just because the church gets knocked back on their heels, that doesn't mean we're, we're pinned. It doesn't mean the game is over. God is calling us to get back on our feet. Square off again with the challenges. And that's the call for every church in the city. You don't have to go looking for a mission field, folks. About 20% of people in the country will be at worship today. Huge numbers have no real connection with the church. And these are people you know. And if you know them enough to know them and call them friends, maybe it's enough to say, God loves you. Can we talk about this? That's a challenge. And through God's word and prayer, you can rise up to meet that challenge. We can live in faith, knowing that there is nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Let us profess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Made alive in Christ and filled with his Spirit, let us pray for the Church and the world and all of God's creation. Ever-living God, you awaken faith amidst our doubts and fears. Reveal your presence so that we recognize your power at work in your church and throughout the world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy Creator, the earth receives your promise of new life Seeds die to bear fruit, and plants decay to nourish the soil. Restore all living things as you intend. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Giver of peace, when you make your presence known, you do so by offering peace. Bring such peace to peoples and nations ravaged by war, violence, and natural disaster. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Healing God, you breathe hope into rooms of despair. Be with the sick, the lonely, the grieving, and those in any need. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of welcome, you are with this assembly as we worship. Bless all those who God draws to this community and be with those who cannot be present this day. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, with you all things are possible. With the saints, make us live in hope, trusting that though we do not see, we believe. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive our prayers, merciful God, and dwell in us richly. Through Jesus Christ, our life and our Redeemer. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory for forever. Amen. Please be seated. In this time of reflection and response, you're invited to fill out your welcome card, share any reflections, questions, or prayers on the back. Also, take this time to prepare your offering. For those gathered, the collection plates are in the front and in the back, and there is a QR code in the bulletin to give electronically. For those online, please go to our website, stlukesbloomington.org, there is a link to give at the bottom of every page. 
Enjoy this time. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace.
Go in peace and proclaim the good news. Be to God.